The simple questions are always the hardest to answer. So never more than before is there going to be a requirement for the independent board member to challenge the executive. But to challenge the executive in a way that promotes the business, that's, that facilitates the decision-making process, rather than delays it by, for example, a board member may want to drill down into detail that he or she would feel comfortable with. If, for example, they come from a financial or legal background, they may decide to want more information that the executive will, of course, have available to them. But it may not be what the independent board member, what the board is there to do, in fact, because the board, even with co-regulation, is there to drive the business forward. At the same time, it's got to understand what the risks are and to ask those very simple questions. So, for example, one might be, what would success look like? What is our plan B? What is our exit strategy? It's always the question that begins, what if? And they're always the good questions to start the debate going. And if a board member can demonstrate, yes, we've looked at this proposal, we've asked questions, We've asked, what if this happens? What if this doesn't happen? What if the perfect storm occurs? And I think that's a demonstration of assurance. Now that is how a board will think and debate. Of course, an effective organisation will have all those risk assurance place, uh, uh, mechanisms in detail, but it's the intellectual capacity of the board member and the dynamics of the board when it's making those decisions together that's going to make those assurance controls effective. Yes, I think it's more important than ever that investors, and possibly particularly the new private investors that are coming into and have come into the market, are reassured, if you like, that the quality of the decision making, of the board decision making, is as high as possible. They are very, very interested and will look closely at how the organisation in which they're going to invest their investors' funds are going to be properly managed. They want the confidence that the governance and the management capability is as high as it possibly can be. Which means that going forward, the recruitment, the ongoing training and development of board members is going to be key because working in this so-called deregulated environment that we're going to be enjoying shortly, there is a freedom, a freedom in some decision-making without the scrutiny of the HCA or the regulator providing the safety net. So it's all about how does the independent board member, the non-executive board member, engage with the executive? How do they work together? Do they have enough information? Do they not have too much information? Is it being distilled? Because with co-regulation, the buck is stopping with the board. There are extra levels of duty of care for, for professionally qualified board members, yes, but a board member should never be recruited, in my view, to replace a skills gap in the executive team. But there needs to be this harmonious working together and this challenging, this challenging by the non-executive board of the executive in a way that means the outcome is the delivery, the assured delivery of the business. Yes, of course it does. And the drive for commercial skills is in itself being driven by the need for associations to be more commercial, to deliver their business, to increase housing supply. So, it's, it's going to be a consequence definitely of it, but I think the danger is that, for example, an organisation might think we're possibly not too strong in the financing area, so perhaps we'll recruit a non-executive to help us through with that. And I think that's not the right approach. I think the, the role of the independent board member is much more strategic, and the danger is that you would rely too heavily upon that non-executive board member when it really should be something for the organisation to be dealing with at executive level. But yes, it's absolutely right, the dynamics of the business are changing and I think it's something that's going to have to be addressed by boards to make sure that whatever they do, no matter how commercial they're being, 
selling multi-million properties, for example, disposing of assets that they thought they would never dispose of, they are absolutely clear and united in that the reason they're doing for it is for their social purpose. And this is something that needs to be cascaded right through the organisation as well. It's a cultural matter and boards must be alive to this. And it's to do with the way board members are recruited, their induction, and it's to do with their ongoing training and development, which is something that should be addressed. It should be not something that's left for, say, once a year, perhaps something that can be done on a regular basis to be factored in. It doesn't need to be formal, but it needs to be a way of making sure that skills are kept up to date, that board members are given the necessary information to make the best possible decision for the organisation. So yes, it's exciting times, it's very different, but I don't think the two are necessarily going to be a conflict. It's managing the culture, making sure the support's there, making sure the training and development programme is there for them.